welcome to the Literaries Podcast. I'm Maren McPhail. And I'm Morgan Manich. And the title for this one is a little, a little inflammatory, I would say. We're starting off Quite this literally. podcast. We're starting <laughs> off this podcast with some interesting, interesting topics. Villains. Yes, not just Captain Hook, although he will we will have shenanigans involved. We will Captain be talking Hook. shenanigans about Captain Hook, but we're gonna be discussing various villains. What makes him a good villain? Literally, there's there's a lot to unpack. Here. There's a lot. There's a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do we want to start with Captain Hook? Because I feel like let's, we have a lot of feelings about let's him. Let's start with Captain Hook. In case you haven't realized, <laughs> we love Captain Hook in this house. We love Captain Hook. We're here for Captain Hook. Not just because we think he's hot and uh, uh, in a different way than you're thinking. Let's start off with that. We're not like thirsting over Captain Hook. Much. <laughs> Much. <laughs> Much. And very specific versions of Captain Hook. Very specific versions of Captain Hook. Mostly literary. Mostly literary. Well, do we want to start talking about why, out of all the villains, Captain Hook is a favorite? Yes. You start, because you really, really like Captain Hook. I think I'm like, yeah. That <laughs> I feel like that sounds really my, wrong. But... My personality comes back to my love for Captain Hook. <laughs> well, P- I think part of it is... Peter Pan growing up has always been my favorite Mm -hmm. Disney movie. Yes. One of my favorite just general stories. I agree. Yes. I've loved it in every medium. Like, I've loved it as a play or a ballet. Like, Mm -hmm. something about the story itself Mm -hmm. hits me emotionally in a way that no other story does. Mm -hmm. I think there's a bittersweet element to it, and I think Mm -hmm. that's why. You love those. Yeah, you know I love a bittersweet moment, and I think that's why. Even the Peter Pan 2 movie. Oh, I, I watched Peter Pan 2 more than I watched Peter Pan 1. Like, I was the that the ending kid. of that? I, I, oh, I, I never tried to watch it. it as an adult, and I cried. Like, I full never cried, like a child. And I was like, fine <laughs> with it when I was a kid, but apparently I had no soul. <laughs> ow. I cried Only... in, like, the first 30 minutes when she's, like, yelling at her brother. I was like, no, I, I can't oh handle that. Oh, my gosh. That. No. No, but that's always been like one of the core titles. Yeah. Of my, I guess I would go Disney so catalog. far as to say, but even just the, gen- like, even in college, like, I wrote a whole research paper on like the history of Peter Pan on oh, the stage cool. and what, you know, why certain things developed the way they did, why mm-hmm. women were cast as Peter. Yeah. Exploring why Mr. Darling is often cast as Captain Hook. Mm-hmm. And the symbolism behind all of those things. So it's yeah. always been my go-to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Captain Hook, therefore. <laughs> I just love him as a villain. He's interesting. He It's interesting because you just... There's so much to this story, as I think is true with many villains, that you mm-hmm. don't always know their side. Mm-hmm. But... I I constantly am, you know, it begs the question, what happened? We know Peter Pan cut off his hand. Mm -hmm. What happened to... Ow. I would have (laughs) probably died. Yeah. Just not even from bleeding, just from general, like, no, I'm not going to live like this. Like, I would not be like, yeah, I'm going to wear a hook now and, like, be a pirate and continue on. Like, no, I would simply perish on... (laughs) On the spot. The ship, on the spot. And make it dramatic. (laughs) Yes, very dramatic. It uh, makes me wonder what's what was going on for him and in this world prior to Peter Pan cutting mm-hmm. off his hand. What were the dynamics mm-hmm. of this man that has it out for a child in a and world where that, grown up is bad? Yes. And because of that, it's like the framing of the story, I think, makes everything about it so good is because mm-hmm. there is that deeper sort of connection, like that that little nagging thing that you can see, like even – George Darling being cast as Captain Hook like you can see that and you're like oh there is something to that it's not yeah. spoken to you directly in the story but you can just tell there's there's an underlying like simmering something under that surface of mm-hmm. all this villainy and all this you know oh mm-hmm. he's the big bad guy okay but like there's there's more to that story and you can't you it's not necessarily said out loud or like explained especially because it's from sort of Wendy's perspective mm-hmm. she doesn't understand what has gone on but there's there is something that has it's sort of transpired to get it to this this 
point of, of of a grown man fighting a child, which I would too. That Peter Pan is a nuisance. I love him, but I would fight yeah. him. It's like I loved him growing up. Yes, and like, now I'm an I adult. <laughs> legit had a Peter Pan costume. Yeah, that I would wear when I was like four, and I would mm-hmm. jump off the couch. No, at, like convinced. I'm gonna fly <laughs> today. Today is gonna be the day. I um, was a Tinkerbell girl because she was sassy. So I was like, I'm about yeah. the drama. I want to be Tinkerbell. Yeah. But, but but then like I remember having a Wendy nightgown. That yes, was the blue with the like yes. puff sleeves. But see, as I've grown older, I'm I'm more sympathize with Wendy and you know yeah that sort of thing which I think that's a whole other discussion of like that's the point of the book you know is 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 growing up and you know loving it, Peter and then realizing yeah because my fiance and I named Hugo for those of you that don't <laughs> that have not heard me mention him you know we're considering going to Disney for our honeymoon mm-hmm. and I I love to meet characters you know this I don't <laughs> I get scared because I have anxiety about it because I'm like, I need to impress Cinderella and I need, need to, to look cool them. in front of Cinderella. <laughs> and I don't know how to do that. So I get scared. Yeah. But anyway, I was like talking to him. I was like, if we meet Peter Pan, I was like, this oh, sounds over. That. Yeah. I'm like, this sounds over dramatic as hell. Mm-hmm. But it's going to be really weird to be going up to Peter Pan as an adult married. Yeah. And being like, oh, you know, yeah. it just. As a Something, kid, oh, I was obsessed it's so with Peter Pan. <laughs> I, in Disney World, there's like the storybook theater, whatever, whatever that mm-hmm. theater is to the side of Main Street to the right. And they yes. ha- used to have like storybook things. Like there was a Snow White one where she like read her story out and it was the character yeah. reading it. And there was a Peter Pan one. And he was my first crush at that point. I did not yeah. know what I was feeling, but I made my parents go back in the line and go back in and redo the story time. So I did it twice because I was I love in love with Peter Pan. I have a picture of it. I need to find Aww. that because I have a picture of me like like very clearly like in distress because I don't understand what about Peter Pan I like so much. But oh my gosh, you are immediately like, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the poor performer that had to deal with me. I know he's he's probably it probably wasn't the first time. Yeah, I think no, little kids very not. much get flustered around. The oh characters. yeah. Uh, but Captain Hook, as I've gotten older, has become more intriguing to me because I think I'm thinking him less as an adult and more of as an equal. So mm-hmm. I'm seeing his story. Yeah, and the whole story from a different. You know, from the perspective yeah. that Peter Pan is a menace. Like, we love yeah. him, but... Oh, my he, God. He's like, he doesn't fun. stop. He yeah. doesn't stop. Just stay in your little tree house and, and be, be like, cook meals and just live there. And that's all you do. Well, he can't you cook a meal. Antagonize he can't people. cook a meal. I know. He needs a mother to do it for him. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, somewhere <laughs> something really went wrong. A, a mother wife. <laughs> A mother wife. Yeah. <laughs> oh no! I don't think you kiss your mother, but okay. Okay. You don't, you don't give your mother an acorn kiss. An acorn kiss. <laughs> if it's not an acorn kiss, we don't. I don't want, want it. it. <laughs> anyway, back to Captain Hook. Yeah, we keep going on to talk about <laughs> Peter Pan's not the object of this discussion. No. Again, he takes over everything. Little menace. We've fallen into his trap. His carefully <laughs> laid plans. So what do you think makes Captain Hook a good villain? He's justified. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, in a sense that, like, it's not like he wants power or he wants any. He just wants to be kind of left alone. Like, he just Mm -hmm. wants to he just wants to run a ship. He just wants to do that. And this kid is just coming in and and declaring him a villain. Like, Mm -hmm. no one else said, like, oh, this person is bad. Necessarily, and I, I might be misreading that because I haven't read the book since I was a literal child, and I, t- yeah, and I don't have the nuance to like talk about it as an adult. But like, Peter Pan really was the one that was like, "You are, you are bad, and I'm going to go after you." And he's just mm-hmm. kind of sitting there like, "Okay, like if you're going to fight yeah. me, I'm going to fight." Like, which yeah. is kind of fine. Like that's understandable. And that's why, like, I really want there to be something canon about captain hook's backstory Mm -hmm. that's not just like you know different fan theories but i would love in an ideal world for there to be a canon here's how he came to be who he is Mm -hmm. and why 
he's feeling this way, mm-hmm. why he's to the point of like really going after wanting yeah. to kill. A mental breakdown. <laughs> mental bur- Menti B. Menti B. I was going <laughs> to. Captain Hook is having a full on Menti B over yes. an like <laughs> 10 year old child. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I just, I want to know more about his background and. Yeah. I think also, like, not knowing his background and just the framing of the story to say he he's only kind of a villain because he's an adult. And exactly. Adults in this story are villainized, like George mm-hmm. Darling. Like, kind of he's reasonable villain. request. You're moving out of the nursery. You're a young woman now. Like, you, like especially in that time period of, like, you're going to have to, like, start she, participating yeah. in society and, like, to do that, you are not a child anymore and you're going to have to grow up is not necessarily a bad thing. But because you're a yeah. kid and you're watching that, you're like, oh, he's so mean for doing that to her, like separating her yeah. from her brothers and whatever. Like she's just moving down the hall at the end of the day. <laughs> like she's no just moving a door down. Wendy. Get no sympathy out of the nursery. Well, but at, the end of the to- at she doesn't have sympathy for herself at the end of the story. Because that's sort yeah. of at the end, she sort of accepts that, you know what? Like, especially with the second movie, her being an adult and, like, married with children. She sort of did – she fell into sort of the Captain Hook, George Darling thought pattern of, like, you know, I do have to be an adult. Like, Peter Pan didn't win at the end of that story because he didn't, like, continue to grasp in that, like, mindset of, like, I I don't want to grow up. No, she wanted to grow up and and, in the sense that Captain Hook is kind of invalidated as her villain because that's not – you know something she looks down on anymore yeah and it's there's the quote from the jm barry book where Mm -hmm. at the end it's something i'm not quoting it exactly right but yeah something to the effect of you need not feel sorry for wendy Mm -hmm. because in the end she grew up of her own free will a day quicker than all the other girls yeah and there's this moment where she she lets go of that and And accepts and enjoys the fact that in order to grow up, you have to give some things up. And I think reckoning with Captain Hook as Peter Pan's villain, but maybe not, you know, as as a grown woman, not my villain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and he's hot. I mean. He's hot. So what rendition of Captain Hook do you think is the hottest? I like. Just I like to the chase. I like Jason Isaacs just because I like Jason Isaacs as a Jason as a, Isaacs is as a man as, as, as a, a man. <laughs> I grew up with Harry Potter. I I can't help it. Like I like Jason Isaacs in The Patriot when he plays Tavington. That yes. to me is supreme hotness. Yes, but in terms of Captain Hook, and people are gonna be like, "You're weird," and that's fine. My supreme version mm-hmm. of Captain Hook. I'm looking him up again. <laughs> is Dustin Hoffman in Hook? I think he yeah. looks the most realistic to uh, what the costuming Hook would actually be. Impeccable. The costuming, the wig, the mustache. He and the and his voice too. When you watch it, mm-hmm. he embodies the character for me. Yes, completely. <laughs> Come, like, like Jason Isaacs is his own kind of like almost feel like a a rustic take, but yeah, Dustin Hoffman as Hook is like that's like yeah. hit the nail it's on like, the head. It's yeah, that's that's the like the canon sort of interpretation yes. of it. Yes, yeah, and I'm like, yep, here for that. <laughs> yeah, any any put a man in a period piece of like clothing, and I'm like, yeah. Even if it's no, Captain Hook, it's like you have on the red no. coat and the the yeah, wig, the hat. Yeah, like yeah, hot, like the tricorn. I can't help it. Yeah, <laughs> like yes, welcome. With like the lace and the feather, like yeah, hot. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We were and talking the hook? about like earlier, like like his box of hooks that he selects. Yes, his hook from that's hot. He's a man a who has fashion man. sense. Yes, he picks fashion. the hook for the day. Yes, screws it on, and mm-hmm. it's like yeah, I'm gonna take on the world and take on this menace of yeah. a child. Yeah, and there's something to be said for that, like, sympathetic villains. There is more fascination with that than there ever was before. For as, sure. As, like, like, fiction books have, like, ramped up in, like, quality and quantity, mm-hmm. and, like, movies have grown more, like, 
self-aware and like speculative rather than like mm-hmm. just a fun good time like where the, yeah. the good guy defeats the bad guy like it's grown more of a nuanced and conversation and even in YA there's so many books coming out yes that have been coming out for several years mm-hmm. where the villain stories are being explored often as mm-hmm. you know a point of view character yeah and you're seeing yeah, even like you're learning what makes them tick. Yes. Why did it happen that way? Even there's like a, a fascination with like enemies to lovers and like morally gray mm-hmm. characters like yeah. that, I think, stems from the fact that villains kind of never got their day in a way that was like fully examined. Like, like yeah. classic Disney movies, the evil queen didn't have a motivation besides, you know, she's jealousy. She's bad. She's jealous. You know, that's yeah. that's it. Like, there mm-hmm. was no exploration of like what got her to that point there was no no discussion of that it was just like she's the bad guy and that's the role she fulfills that's it it was very one no like i think when these movies were coming out you know snow white in the 30s peter mm-hmm. pan in the 50s mm-hmm. the villain was the villain and for the most part it was pretty one note but only now are we really i think mm-hmm. i feel like the 90s disney movies them. started mm-hmm. that like, and I mean, even with like Ursula, you get a little bit of a, just a touch yeah. of backstory because she says something yeah. when I Especially lived at the with palace. the second movie yeah. too, with her sister, yeah. which I love her sister because her name is Morgana. So I'm like, anything that has my name, I have to like. So, so you want I'm, to live I'm, in like an ice cave with yes. shark Toadie? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. And I really honestly potions. do. <laughs> yes, that would be just fun. Just let me send me to an ice I cave like and let me mix worse, my potions. There are worse less fulfilling jobs than being able yeah. to turn kids into mermaids like, yeah honestly, that's that's fun that's, that's a good career yeah, yeah that's a good career i mean again she's portrayed as evil i don't know why i i would love to be a mermaid so i don't know when why. do we not want to be a mermaid never okay but i'm tying it back now oh peter pan has oh. you know is a menace to captain hook and there's that yeah. rift there but in the movie, yeah. when Captain Hook comes on the boat, the mermaids mm-hmm. flip out and yeah. they're like, they dive into the water. What's been I going forgot on about that. with all the other people of Neverland, all the other that. species and races there, that clearly he must be causing conflict, yeah. not just with Peter Pan and the Lost Boys. But at that What's point, it's like, what, what catalyst was was the, the start of that? Yeah. Like, did they antagonize him? Because we've seen the mermaids be antagonistic towards Wendy, especially. Oh, yeah. I mean, trying to drown someone would be considered villainy to me. So, like, oh, yeah. what are the dynamics of Neverland that the mind of a child doesn't really see is, like, kind of what I took from that. Well, is like Kind of now that I'm thinking about it, it feels like everyone's a villain. Mermaids. Because yeah, cause the, cause the idea of Neverland is an allegory for how a child sees the world. Mm-hmm. So, is it like to to present an underlying thing of like what what a child sees as as villainy isn't good or is it like a a way to speak to like everything could be considered bad to someone like Mm -hmm. or there or like even just the mermaids being an archetype of like you know this is the jealous girl archetype sort of thing yeah or i think the the vibe of these things as a child that you're enamored with sometimes things simply as you get older, you realize don't live up to your expectations and your yeah. dreams and fantasies of those things. Yeah. And it's not all that it seems. All that glitters yeah. is not gold. Mm-hmm. Ooh, fancy phrasing in here. I have a question for you. Okay. Do you think that nowadays with all of these, like, sort of conversations around, you know, the bad guy of the book, do mm-hmm. you think that conversation makes them a better villain or do do you think that, you know, being able to hate them wholeheartedly without being given sympathy for them makes them a better villain? I like, personally for me, I like having sympathy for a villain. Mm-hmm. Because, again, I think it comes back to that bittersweet thing. Yeah. If we're assuming the villain gets vanquished in the end, I still want that attachment where they had it coming, but there's also this mm-hmm. glimmer of what could have been, who they could have been, mm-hmm. and why that didn't happen. Yeah. So I like the sympathy because we have sympathy for the protagonists Mm -hmm. and side characters. It's only fitting that we get that sympathy for a villain, too, even if they're Mm -hmm. doing the most shady ass things you can imagine. Yeah. 
I I like that, but I'm also of the opinion that I really like a just just unhinged evil villain that you just hate. Like the okay, mm-hmm. this is this is like a contemporary example, but like Big Little Lies, the show Big Little Lies. I just got HBO Max to watch The Last of Us, and I was watching that. Meryl Streep's character plays this like vindictive mother-in-law that oh. wants to wants to that you know like her son was not a good man, and she but she wants her her grandchildren and she wants to get them Mm -hmm. by however means necessary and just how she's written is just she comes across as the sympathetic old woman but then she'll just make a comment and Uh it's like you just hate her you just wholeheartedly hate her and you can't like you can't like you can't sympathize with her in a lot of ways but then Mm -hmm. they bring it they they do bring it back eventually to say like oh she is she is just misguided, but at the same time, you're like, I just, I just hate unconditionally, and it's like yeah. I still think that's worthwhile now, and I don't think mm-hmm. because we swing to sympathetic villains that we should swing away from that because I feel like that's yeah. such a cool story too to just have this pure antagonistic mm-hmm. force that's just pushing down the main characters, and like it's completely. Too, like sometimes different stories call for different different villains. Like mm-hmm. one story might call for. The kind that Meryl Streep plays in Mm -hmm. Big Little Lies and other Mm -hmm. stories, you might need a little more meat to make sense of that character. Yeah. And it depends on the story, what's really going to fly. Yeah. And I guess it just depends on, like, what what matches with the main character. Because I would argue that Peter Pan and Captain Hook are, like, the perfect duality. Like, you can can kind of examine that. It brings to mind, I believe it was, oh, it was a few years ago. I think it was V.E. Schwab Mm -hmm. that said this quote. And if I'm giving her credit and it was someone else, let me know. But she said, my protagonist is in the process of becoming a villain. And my villain is in the process of becoming a protagonist. That quote stuck with me. (laughs) Yeah, because it's like, like most of the time your protagonists aren't completely good either. And if they are, then they're not as interesting to read about. Like villains, Mm -hmm. you can kind of play with how totally unsympathetic they can be, but protagonists Mm -hmm. have to have that like through line of, you know, they're, they're human or else it's just, it's just reading, you know, the golden boy going and (laughs) doing all this stuff and succeeding. And then everything's fine. I have another question, by the way. Okay. (laughs) I keep thinking of things. You and I write historical how yeah. did those, like, genres that aren't necessarily, like, high fantasy, where, like, a traditional yeah. villain, as you think of, or even, like, Big Little Lies, like, a contemporary work. Mm-hmm. Like, how, do, yeah. how do you think, how do you think a good villain is portrayed in those kinds of, like, outlier works where it's not necessarily, like, a villain, it's more, like, an antagonist? I mean, I think, obviously, you're not going to have the bells and whistles of... Uh, you know, someone like Maleficent who has yes. their dark stormy castle Iconic. and their magic. Iconic. We we love Maleficent too in this house. Yes, that um, <laughs> that movie I love the live action Maleficent movie oh, and I yeah. love the sequel. And I will yes. rewatch them constantly because they are very good. Totally. Totally. But I think in historical, and I think again, I think this comes back to more to my more sympathetic bent to a villain mm-hmm. is when you're in a historical world. They don't have the the dark, stormy palace. At least maybe they do. Maybe <laughs> your historical character does um, have a literal palace. I have one that does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but more so, what what in the what in their world, not necessarily their personal life, but also their world has enabled their train of thought. Yeah. How have their lives interacted with society around them? And what does that look like as the years are passing, as history is being written? What's influencing their choices and where they feel they need to stand in a world that was in some ways very similar to ours, but also very different? Yeah. I mean, I feel like in historical, one of the main antagonists that every book has is society, especially like I think, when you I think Victorian. So Oh, yeah, totally. There's so much to build off of and a lot of injustices there. And you had to do a lot of, you know, you know this, we're, we're mm-hmm. preaching to the choir, but, <laughs> you know, sometimes a lot of things simply to survive in the mm-hmm. strictures of society. 
and what was deemed appropriate and successful there wasn't a lot of wiggle room so that in and of itself is yeah not not a lot yeah do you think that historical books absent of like a villain figurehead can be just as good as those with like do you think that society has to have a voice or that society can just act how it acts and be a force i think society can act how it acts and be a force i think so too i think especially if you're uh, writing it's cool sometimes it's cool that there isn't just some guy out to get you like it's like you're you're... just the circumstance and i think that's realistic too sometimes there isn't a single person out to get you it's just the circumstances of the day and age and what's going on and how the chips fall yeah like we learned that in school like but (laughs) there's there's yeah (laughs) there's like environmental villains like yeah. I learned that in school, like there was like yeah. a chart with like the kinds of antagonists you could have, and like environmental yeah. antagonism is something, and like, like that a would never be one we really... would look at. Like that exactly, it would be yeah. like we would when we would look at it, we would say, "Oh, it's like a natural disaster or something like that," mm-hmm. like something or a pandem- fully tangible. Oh. I don't know if we're allowed to say the, the p word, the p word, the panorama. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, we're familiar with the, uh, with the, with the natural environmental antagonist. <laughs> I mentioned The Last of Us earlier, and this this just came Mm -hmm. out, so it might be relevant. But very much so, there are very much villains in that story. But the main Mm -hmm. villain is more so the 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 virus that is spread, like the fungal infection that is spread, and like made their world what it is. That's like what I would consider like the main problem in their world is the fact that their world has been destroyed by this. You know, the Mm -hmm. it's called the cordyceps, but it's like this this thing is the antagonist like that that Mm -hmm. is what i would consider the main thing and like i feel like that's so underutilized now and it's just starting Mm -hmm. to be sort of worked back into stories that you know a historical book doesn't have to have a guy with like a cane saying like you have to marry a guy like it doesn't have to be that no it can be just them living them life their lives and having to like reckon with the world they live in and what what would be acceptable or what would you know ruin their life in that way and you can sometimes, as I think we have seen in each other's work, you can mm-hmm. have both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can have what society expects and societal mm-hmm. pressures and norms and mm-hmm. that conflict with the added and antagonist yeah. piling and in there. Sometimes their views both on top is of that. fun. Yeah. Sometimes that makes for optimal drama. I I like when I like when there's not villains, but I also like when there are villains because I usually end up rooting for the villain in some way. I mean, you know, like I read your book and I didn't come out with, you know, I came out liking like the pets of the book and the villain of the book. And you were like, what, <laughs> what did, what book did you read? <laughs> Couldn't help it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you do seem to have a penchant for like, especially loving the villains. I don't know what it is about me, but it's like, I'm more like, I just I just think they're f- funner to read about. Like, it's just... Like, even when they're not sympathetic, it's like, usually something about them is just so dramatic and just entertaining and just... I think it's an they outlet They just throw for, wrenches into yeah, everything. Yeah, and I think, like we've said, sometimes writing a villain, reading a villain is almost the outlet for your inner Karen. Yes. There's something almost <laughs> cathartic about reading a character that absolutely does not care. Yeah. Or you cares can, for you all can the say wrong whatever reasons. you want and, and yes. not have repercussions you can like vent your frustrations about even your main character like i feel like everyone every writer has frustrations about their main character that they can't kind of reckon with but then the villain walks in roast your main character yeah and everything you've made (laughs) you've made you've made you can roast them now yeah 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 i yeah i just i don't know why but i just i think even when they're completely evil it's just something about me some sick part of me is like this is more fun but I do think historical drama. historical villains are the hottest. As we they have a flair, they do they have, have a flair. And like as we mentioned with Captain Hook being in the historical dress, there's yes. something about putting an attractive man <laughs> in that setting and that outfit with those motives that just read so nicely on a screen or on the page. Yeah, we were talking about Troy earlier, like the movie Troy. And yeah. I, like, mentioned, like, half the reason I like it is because of Iliad, and half the reason is because they're hot Greek warriors. And it's, like, that contribute like, that honestly contributes to my feelings about, like, real life. Like, 
Mm-hmm. I have like a very there's some historical figures I have really complicated relationships and I don't understand what it is I like about them, but because yeah. they're awful people. But it's like that's how I feel about Achilles because it's he was like just this man child like there was like mm-hmm. so much nuance to him, but like he was not the best person. And then Brad Pitt walks up and it's like, well, I can't do anything about how that. Can you- I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. I can't do anything about that. And sometimes the good looks is like, that's what lures you in. That's yeah. what. Yeah. It's like, it's like that saying about like how poisonous things have like really pretty colors to warn you to stay yeah. away. It's like that. Mm-hmm. The hot ones <laughs> warn you to stay away. Yeah. So speaking yeah. of hot ones. No. Yeah. Let's talk about another one of our favorite villains Ooh. by the name of Gaston. You have to start here because I need to know <laughs> if you're going to change my mind before I say anything. So we we haven't really fully discussed this before, but Morgan it has... It came up. It came up. She has her reasons for why Gaston is not a villain. Mm-hmm. I have reasons for why he is. You have to start because I'm not very strong in my position and I could be okay. swayed. So, so okay. <laughs> Op- the opening arguments for why Gaston is a villain. Mm-hmm. Um, obvi- there's some of the obvious things. Yeah. Like he uh, tries to kill the beast. Yeah. He basically breaks and enter. It breaks and enters into their castle. You know, mm-hmm. just the general crimes. Getting... Bell's father thrown into the insane asylum cart. Mm-hmm. Just kind of a few of a smattering of, of crimes. My argument is strengthening. I'm just letting you know. Okay. However, I think what makes him the most villainous to me, mm-hmm. and maybe to you after you hear <laughs> my argument, <laughs> is that he has everyone hoodwinked. And he has mm. this power to influence mm. in a way that other people also lose their morals. And it just continues to snowball from yeah. there. He <laughs> has people going with the flow. He has people becoming sheep. And that makes, you know, his negative energy all the greater and My stronger. Is weakening. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I think really gets it for me is that no one questions him. Yeah. yeah. And it really, it's, he's, he kind of, to me, this it might be a more negative view of society. He, to me, represents society yeah. and, and what happens when we get wrapped up in mob mentalities and go after each other and what that can do emotionally. My argument so. has been dealt a fatal blow, but I will, <laughs> I will explain what I was going to okay. explain. Okay. So that's the gist of it for me. And, to your and point, the short version. To your point about the crimes, I too would throw a guy in an asylum if he presented no proof of there being a magical beast and talking objects in the woods in a castle I've never seen. If I discovered there was a beast in the woods, I would also probably try to hunt it down because that's scary. And if there was magical enchanted objects attacking my friends, I would also try to kill them. So that that's my valid. that's that my argument valid. for that for those crimes. <laughs> That's valid. But to your point about the the villainy of, you know, mob mentality, you're probably you're right about that. Like I'm not gonna try I'm not gonna try and argue my way out of that one. But yeah, he he does have that sort of quality to him. But I will say there are some protagonists that have that too. Oh so yeah. So it I guess it's how he uses it. It's but, how he uses it. And it's like but, so many villains have the magic and the you know the, the charisma. Accoutrement. He doesn't have any powers mm-hmm. it's just him yeah and really Which, i guess you could go so far as to say the village as a whole has its own problems and that yeah. they might be the more collective villain to to the Belle provincial the town beast. the yeah. provincial town this provincial life yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so but that i think th- yeah you're right yeah. about that i'm not gonna try and argue i think there about were some that, things but... there in that village mm-hmm. that there, were wrong some inherent dysfunction that allowed yeah. someone like gaston to come forth and mm-hmm. rule the roost but there's the thing that, like did he really have to try hard like was he trying to hoodwink them necessarily or was he just living his life and people gravitated towards him and he just kind of did what he did because he could like he that's just what he would I naturally think it's the do charisma i think he probably had i think there's an arrogance there that he probably naturally just got people into thinking he was the crop 
Yeah, I guess. And it just it just evolved from there. There's no origin story, so we can't really uh, look at it. I'm gonna start writing one. I think they are making a they are making a series with Luke Evans, right? About Oh my gosh. That no Gaston's life prior. Gaston is not a villain. Luke Evans. Good night, everyone. Good night. There we go. (laughs) There we go. Fabulous. I mean, best casting. That's all I gotta say. Perfect, perfect perfect casting. Perfect casting. But if they make this Gaston show, Mm-hmm. Like I have heard, and it's about his rise and fall to power mm-hmm. in said provincial <laughs> town. I'm going to thrive. Yeah, no. Uh, there's there's something to be said for like villains that revel in their villainy. Like yeah. that that really that there's some villains that are sympathetic because they like they know they're doing wrong, but they think it's the best. Or like even like like certain villains that like they're only villains because the story presents them that way, not because they themselves present that way. But there's something to be said for villains that just enjoy being evil. Like they just they just like, you know, that kind of thing that they're doing. Well, I have another quick honorable mention of a of a oh, villain that intrigues yay. me, and and probably intrigues you too. Mm-hmm. Um, and a much more philosophical level is Frollo mm-hmm. from Hunchback of Notre Dame. Ooh, I wasn't allowed to watch that movie when I was a kid. We got to the Hellfire scene and my mom said, okay, we're turning this off now. Yeah, I don't blame you. It's kind of dark. But now like that we're older, I'm like, dang, Hellfire is a bop. Is a bop. Oh, it's such oh, a good it's song. So good. It's on my playlist. It's so but, good. But you, when you listen as an adult and you hear the like, lyrics, you're like, oh, geez. hold up, hold up, hold the phone. We watch this like as children. I, we watched this. I had an Esmeralda doll, and like this was what was going on. And we this didn't movie. do anything. You watched it. I was I was barred from from you were barred eyes from it. it. I fully. Hey, my birthday is topsy turvy day. So oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, January sixth is topsy turvy day. So like it only, it's part of who I am. Yes. <laughs> no, but yeah, that, he, but that's he's ooh. yeah he's he's hits home for a lot of people because it's real like it's, it's like that's real. that's genuine. and that's what's scary is it feels mm-hmm. so yeah so real and, like it could happen uh, like maleficent oh, totally. is its own it, thing it does but, happen yeah mm-hmm. but people Ooh. in power are the scariest people of all <laughs> it's true that's it's true. philosophical thought we're commenting to that on... point the white witch from narnia <laughs> oh she's a good villain I really like very it. good, and villain. especially Tilda Swinton. We talk about actors a lot, like because we just like yeah. how the people she, are portrayed. Well, she does apparently. an incredible job. Yeah, but I think again, it comes back to so much of Narnia is rooted in the allegorical mm-hmm. and the White Witch, essentially representing the devil and all and evil. hell and all evil. But it, as it starts out, you know, as I'm sure many of us have seen the movie, it mm-hmm. starts out so whimsical, and she's given yeah. Edmund. Treats and Turkish delights. Turkish delight. The name I'd escaped sell out my me. family I'm for like, a Turkish treats. delight. <laughs> She's giving him Turkish delight. She's giving him drinks, and it's you know she looks that whimsical. That was magical to me as a kid. Yes, or making that like hot cocoa or whatever that and was. Her dress, like, out of the snow. Her, dress, oh, her dress. I was like her cast. I was like yes, and then it just gets things go dark off the rails. Fast. It gets yeah. really dark really fast, and yeah, I wonder which why. I think, I'm which I think is the allegorical <laughs> thing. Like yeah. Like evil can look good, look good from a certain perspective, and, and it's then interesting because as it the movie goes on, colors. she like you know she's not wearing that ice dress anymore. Her wardrobe, yeah, her crown, is changing melts. along. Yeah, yeah, <sighs> and w- which there's something to be said for for that in the sense that there there's sometimes villains that represent all evil and they're not done well, and they they just like. They kind of fall flat in the sense of describing that. Yeah. But I think Narnia does a great job of, you know, being being capturing like the the enticing part of of bad things as opposed yeah. to the good the not the good but the 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 obvious like yeah you know bad things that kind of that, like Gaston yeah the White Witch has you know her army charisma. her cronies yeah. her charisma. Not to say and that just, charisma is bad. If you have charisma, no. you're not a villain. <laughs> if you're charismatic, go Sometimes right ahead. Uh, no, I was talking to people in general. I can oh. be charismatic if I if I want, but I, I don't can. think I would <laughs> use that to like take over a country or mm, rule a provincial town or kill a lion. Like you I don't wouldn't. Think I would. 
No. One, maybe that's why I like villains so much. Maybe I am a villain deep maybe inside. You just, maybe we, this podcast has just been us discovering that deep down you're entering your villain arc. <laughs> because your villain era. Because sometimes people say something like about a villain and they're like, I would never do that. And I'm like, I would. <laughs> like, I don't know. Some I don't know what you're I doing. Would. Some things I would, but some of the things I, I would not. Yeah. Like, so, like I'm trying to think of what I would do. Like, <laughs> so when, when people like try to defend villains and they're like... Mm-hmm. Well, they or like try to like you know catch the catch them and say like well they did this it's like well wouldn't you <laughs> like wouldn't you exactly and I think and given that you're put into a situation where you have to to survive as we mentioned with historical villains mm-hmm. it might be surprising what people are willing to do that we're not yeah. gonna like you know say when we're just chatting with people I feel like historical villains often are the most misunderstood too mm-hmm. because we judge things a lot of time I'll say this probably constantly throughout this podcast, but we judge things a lot of times through our modern sensibilities. Yeah. And that's like a problem for like interpreting things because, you know, like the evil curmudgeon that wants to like marry off his daughter to, you know, this this bad man. Like on the outside that looks bad, but we have to understand that that's how people lived. Yeah. So it's it is at the end of the day, he maybe that mer- person's not a maybe that person not a villain. It's it's the society they live in. Like it's yeah, we judge people based on based on how things yeah. were at the time. It's like we shouldn't judge the father. We should judge the society that makes mm-hmm. it so that mm-hmm. a woman has to marry off someone in order to keep her family financially afloat. Yeah, that that in itself being an injustice. Yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Philosophy. <laughs> We love getting philosophical on this podcast. We do. We do like a philosophical moment every now and then, and a hot villain too, <laughs> and a hot villain. But we like a hot villain more than we maybe more than we do a philosophical moment. Yeah, honestly, I would take a hot villain over a good villain. Oh yeah. If most of the time, <laughs> I'm a very visual person. If you can tell by the, all the actors I've mentioned, um, <laughs> I would rather watch watch a bad villain play out if he's hot than than have it be a good villain i think that is totally fine (laughs) yeah and you know what i'm at peace with that maybe that is my villain era (laughs) that's your villain era your reputation era (laughs) i fully encourage you to go on to go on that journey (laughs) (laughs) well you're coming with me you're gonna hear i'm going with you yeah i'm I'm vicariously also going through the journey (laughs) we talked about a lot of disney villains on accident but you know what a lot of disney villains but i think because there are the of- counts as a Disney villain too. Technically, at this point, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It keeps. It keeps. There's a reason that we refer to these stories and why they come up mm-hmm. for so many of us when we're writing, when we're talking about these concepts. There's a reason that some of these examples are what yeah, really hit they're home. So common, yeah, yeah. Especially Captain Hook. Captain Hook is hot. He is hot, and you know what? We are titling the episode that because it's so true, and it's so true. I think, I think every listener knows it. We just, just don't want to admit to, it to themselves. Yeah, we just have to make it known again. You know, we're we're freer than a lot of people here for admitting that Captain Hook is. Oh yeah, hot. yeah. Not the Disney go- version. I will add on that caveat that I'm not about that animation. <laughs> but like, I kind of low key am. <laughs> Like in a weird way. I'm gonna text Hugo like, hey, don't listen to this episode. <laughs> he already is aware. <laughs> I've already explained to him all of why Captain Hook is my favorite. <laughs> and he'll just be like, Yeah, yeah. We we ignore that. Sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Well, well, we hope you enjoyed listening. Don't be surprised if we have villains part two where we just fan a little trap. bit. Mm-hmm. Another thirst trap. This has been the Literaries Podcast. See you next time. Uh, See you next time. (laughs) Bye. Bye.